Pixel Sift is proudly supported by the Murdoch University School of Arts, and if you're looking for a creative degree, they might have they might be able to help you out. If you're keen to learn more, have a look at murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts to find out what they've got on offer. That's murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts, or you can search Murdoch University for more information. Murdoch University School of Arts proudly supporting Pixel Sift. Hello and welcome to episode 157 of Pixel Sift, the show dedicated to indie games from around Australia and the world. My name is Mitch Lowe and joining me tonight is my co-host Adam. Hey Adam, thanks hey, for joining me. How's it going? And our guest tonight is Simon Boxer from Twice Different. So we'll be talking to Simon about his new game, Ring of Pain, which is a dungeon-crawling roguelike card ge- with card-based mechanics. Um, so yeah, it's pretty crazy. There's also a stealth element to it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's got a few interesting mechanical twists, and it's extremely unique, and uh, and it's a really difficult puzzle game. Actually, I've only ever got maybe about midway through. I don't think I've actually finished it yet. Uh, so let's get into it. Australia's best video game podcast. Subscribe to Pixel Sift on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever podcasts are found. So our guest this evening is Simon Boxer from Twice Different, and he's here to talk about his new game, Ring of Pain, which came out, I think, last week, didn't it? Yep. Friday, 3 a.m. for me, or 4 a.m., I should say. Woke up at 3 a.m. to hit that big red, uh, well, it's green, <laughs> green launch button on Steam. So do you do that, and, on, uh, you do that on Steam, don't you? Just like, there's a big button? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's big as far as buttons go. It's not huge, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, they should get you all like a three D printed like button to push it out. Yeah, yeah, like attach that to the mouse maybe, so it feels really epic. Anyway, on that launch button, I've taken us off topic already. But um, can you tell us um, for those of us who don't know what Ring of Pain is, uh, what is Ring of Pain? So Ring of Pain is a roguelike card crawler where encounters come to you. We've sort of created or tried to innovate on the dungeon crawler roguelike format and um, designed sort of like a living dungeon that's generated from cards arranged in a ring so you can observe the whole thing and um, strategize based on what you can see. It's sort of uh, distilled into like an order of actions puzzle, tried to make it really accessible and easy to pick up, but brutally challenging as uh, you said earlier. I find myself... I mean, I... Oh, sorry, oh, go sorry. ahead. Yeah, I, I guess when I, when I think of rogue game, roguelike games, I think about how they're mainly about decision-making and they're about building up core knowledge as you kind of fail again and again and again. Um, And that knowledge is what propels you to eventually have success. Um, And I'm really wondering, and and I feel like Ring of Pain is one of those games, so I'm kind of wondering um, how that premise influenced your design process and and how you wanted to kind of have that that tension between, I guess, failure and also knowledge building for, for players that are coming into the game. Yeah, this is this is something that I feel very strongly about um, because there's kind of this difference between different games on different platforms, especially like mobile games are very handholdy, very like in-depth tutorials and that kind of thing. And the game that we wanted to make was a game that gave players the space to have the insight. So we kind of teach them just enough and then obscure a lot of the rest of the game. So there's um, like a sense of discovery as you play it. We really, really wanted to make it kind of creepy and cryptic. So players go into this like foreign world and part of the fun is exploring and discovering. But that also means, you know, you'll place a foot wrong and you'll get savagely beaten down uh, on occasion. But each death is is a process of learning. And uh, yeah, I find that really interesting about the genre. And we really wanted to sort of capitalize on that, especially as a turn-based strategy game. And, and the puzzle element as well. It's sort of about a process of figuring out how to play it one death or one move at a time. It's- yeah, it, I, like, I, I think the takeaway I had from the game was it reminded me a lot of Cultist Simulator, which is another <laughs> turn-based... Well, not turn-based, that's a real-time card-based game where you're looking at... And I guess the goal of that game is it's narrative-based, but it's kind of about learning how to play the game. That is the actual mm-hmm. game itself. 
And I, I felt a lot of similarities there in the sense that I felt like you gave just enough and then you kind of push you into the deep end essentially in this game and it becomes a process of being like, okay, I kind of know what stealth is, but how valuable is stealth? How valuable are these stats? I'm going to find out over a long string of deaths. Um, I even like how the card mechanic in this game, when you unlock cards, you don't necessarily find out what they do until you find them later on. So yeah, it feels like that sense of discovery is really bled into lots of elements of this game. Definitely, definitely. And and speaking of uh, sort of the, the way, the angle that Cultist Simulator went with the narrative, I really wanted to, to bring a cohesive narrative to this roguelike as well, because not many... Not many roguelikes and dungeon crawlers have like a story being told, but I think that's quite important to unify the whole design. And so we were really trying to give a fresh experience to our players, like from every facet of the game. So was it always your intention to combine all these different gameplay mechanics into one cohesive experience? Because it roguelike and cards and like you, you've, you've managed to create an, a feeling of velocity, even though you are kind of just it's turn-based combat. How, how did you achieve that? Yeah, well, uh, in terms of the the dynamism of it, dynamism of it, we really um, like I, I I gotta take a ton of credit for that. I always like we always had the vision to make it really dynamic and fast-paced, and that's all our programmers who who handled like the turn system that's really in depth and really. Um, yeah, it keeps it really fluid so even more advanced players can play really fast and I think that's very important um, for for any game. Like it's part of the user experience. You want every aspect of it to be really good and seamless. Like you don't want players feeling like they're being, feeling like they're waiting for the game basically. How long has the game been in development? Because I remember seeing it at a couple of PAXs. Yeah, so I started it as a solo project in at the start of 2018. So it's been, yeah, two and a half years pretty much and um, worked on it alone for a year. Like after three months or so, I got Film Victoria funding, which was amazing. Thank you, Film Victoria. And then uh, hired a couple of contractors like for sound audio and a bit of programming help. Took a vertical slice of the game to Gamescom and exhibited it last year. And that's where Humble sort of discovered the game and signed us and then brought on a little team. We've got a team of uh, three part-timers and two full-time and then a couple of contractors as well. And that's where we're at now. So two and a half years. I, I want to ask a question because I, I always think about this when I play one of these like very, um, I almost think of them as puzzle box games in a way. There's so many bits and pieces that always kind of move. Balance is really interesting to me and how you kind of make all these various moving parts in this game, whether it's poison damage or freezing damage or various builds and stats, how how you kind of balance them and make them all work. But what I'm kind of interested in is how does the beginning of that work? Like, do you sit down and actually like make a bunch of cards and try to play a physical game? Like, how do you create a game like like Ring of Pain? Like, where is the beginning steps of, of building a card-based game? I'm always, um, like, I guess my process is kind of a bit more or conventional maybe i tend to like organizing chaos so i'll be like highly iterative i'll get a lot of stuff in and just iterate as i go i don't really have like a solid plan it's more about like seeing where the product takes me and that could be anything from like you know the large scale of a full product or it could be down to like a painting i'll just like start you know start making shapes and see what comes out kind of thing and then use your taste and and test it, of course, um, and observations to help to help refine that. So I didn't start with code card prototypes. It was, um, yeah, for for the first few months of de- development, it didn't have any pass buttons. It was just like trying to distill a dungeon crawler into like, what if you had two paths to choose? Like, we took out the sort of walking through empty tiles uh, that is quite prevalent in dungeon crawlers, and and presented it as cards, like one encounter after another, and then. Yeah, a couple of months in, we'd so I'd sort of added this stealth mechanic, and it, it sort of was like a eureka moment. Oh, like there's more design space to explore when you can actually manipulate the dungeon and navigate in a certain way. That's that's not like walking through empty tiles, but it's it's changing the encounters that you have, um, and that opened up a lot of dis- design space to explore. And there's mechanics that we we built that um, aren't in the game, but who knows, maybe for future content. But um, yeah. 
it was just a very, very explorative, iterative process. With card games such as these, or digital card games, and even physical card games, it, it does tend to sometimes um, feel a bit like a scissors, paper, rock situation. Is, is that something that you lean, to, lean into, or do you, do you feel like you kind of really want to move away from that kind of feeling? Um, I don't think we've really suffered from, from that sort of situation um, with Ring of Pain. The, the nice thing about roguelikes and roguelike balance is that uh, sort of the, the player dream uh, in a roguelike is just to get ridiculously powerful. And so you can actually have some things which are like broken in a, in a fun way. Like you can give players toys, like you can give players like items that are really broken in certain situations and that's okay. Like, especially for a single player game. Um, yeah. So, so it's more like the process of balancing that, that we use is um, sort of assess where players are having problems and then try to give them tools to mitigate like the issues that they're having, but still leaving it up to them for the most part. Yeah, because I think what stands out for me the most in like a really fun roguelike, and this game has this as well, is that that feeling of when you pick up an item and you're like, how can I break the game with this thing? Like, I've got this tiara, and if I don't equip a bunch of items, every time I attack an enemy, they're going to be frozen. Surely I can snowball using this thing and just stack stats. But then so much stats come from items, so there's a trade-off there. And I, I really like the way that this game has me like already getting those cogs turning in my brain, making me think, can I do a poison build that scales ridiculously so that I can just coast through the dungeon or, or what have you? Yeah, we want, we want that all to be viable, and, and we're going to be adding more item content as we go to help build out all the different sort of directions of synergies, which um, like some are more form than others at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's funny you mentioned the Hermit's Tiara, which is an item that freeze, freezes everything on attack if, if you don't have many things equipped because it's, it's very overpowered in an early game. And a lot of people on the internet, like a lot of comments are kind of like, I want to be able to unequip things that I've equipped so I can just keep this freeze effect without even like realizing that they, they would just completely doom them by like mid or late game it's like we're kind of saving the players from themselves in some way as well with the designs yeah it's a so, secret trap item which is what i love about yeah. it it's like you feel really strong for a while but there's a point where you have to kind of accept that you need your other items and i really yes like exactly or learn the hard lesson what's mm. it been like uh taking all that feedback in it's been uh very intense because i am uh I'm doing all the the forums and Steam discussion myself. Like I'm sort of the public face, I suppose. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of work goes into like like listening to people and noting feedback and actually like acting on it, which is the important thing. So we've released a few patches already and like you know pointed out the things that we noticed and have been called out and. Uh, yeah, it's it's all just part of the job, really. Like, it's a part of, I guess it falls maybe into a part of, like, marketing is, like, um, community relations, I suppose. A, a lot of people don't really realize, like, how, what it takes to actually patch a game. Uh, do, you, do you mind going mm. into a bit more detail about how that works? Yeah, so patching a game, um, it's really easy on Steam. Basically, um, we can upload an updated, um, a game build is, is like, when you... Um, when you tell the the program that you make the game in to like create the executable files and stuff, that is what we call a build. And uh, yeah, so the game engine that we use, Unity, you know, they already have good building tools to make these executable files, which we can upload to Steam. And um, Steam has a really good backend that just automatically manages it. So that's quite simple for other platforms, like because we're on Switch, it's a bit more complicated. So Switch. Um, Nintendo has like a multi-week approval process, so uh, this is why games tend to bulk like patches together on Switch to try and get like more like um, time-effective patching, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the general the general process of patching. It's it's reasonably simple, but like you always want to be testing what you're about to put out. Like you don't want to release something and then you know go to sleep and wake up to all these people, you know, because we're especially because we're in the opposite time zone in Australia, like 
if we end of day put a build up, then all like America and Europe will be playing overnight, and we could just come back to <laughs> you know a lot of alarms, I suppose. Um, you mentioned before that like um, I guess a big process of a game like this is testing. Um, mm. and, and making sure things are, are kind of where you want them and where you want them to be. I think that's why I guess a lot of roguelikes go through an early access process. And I thought it was really interesting that you opted instead to do a beta process and not do that sort of extended early access. And I'm curious about why you chose that path and, and some of the pros and negatives that you might have between some of those options when it comes to releasing a game. Yeah, so I, I, I did want to do an early access um originally and it was just uh recommended by our publisher humble to to go straight to full release and i've heard that from a couple of other publishers as well like why they ask sort of why if they're gonna give you the budget like to finish off your game why not just go straight to full release um and i don't know i don't fully know the stats behind it like i still would like to try an early access game at some point but yeah, it just ended up being, we went on the publisher's recommendation, like we could scope it appropriately to get something together. And then also, well, the other actually more important thing is probably that Switch doesn't do early access. And so you want to be able to simultaneously release both products. So you need to sort of have like a version one, really, if you want to launch on Steam and Switch at the same time. So you have a bit of Twitch integration with the game. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Mm. Yeah, we've got some good Twitch integration. A couple of streamers have said it's the best Twitch, Twitch <laughs> integration that they've uh, used. I don't know if they've used any others, but that's what they, that's what they told me. Um, yeah, we really um, we snuck in something like just before launch that we didn't tell any of our community about either, but it's been really fun. Uh, basically, we let players... We let viewers of streamers draw creatures and then the viewers drawings can replace the art that I've made for creatures, the official creature art with all sorts of weird things like, you know, whatever fan art they want to draw or, or like there's a lot of, so there's a, there's a creature called a fire bead and a lot of people draw fire bread. Um, so just like a loaf of bread on fire uh, to replace that one. Um, but yeah, it's really fun. And there's also sort of got voting functionality. So the streamers can say, you know, cast a vote and like the chat will decide basically what items they equip kind of thing. So obviously um, there must be a bit of a vetoing process for the, uh, the user generated, um, the user generated art, because I, yeah. I assume, I assume you'd be probably going through those pretty with a, with a, maybe not such a fine tooth comb, but a comb at least. Yeah, so we definitely wanted to keep, uh, we definitely wanted to give streamers a safety net for that. And um, so drawings need to be approved before they actually can be shown in the game, although streamers can let them all be automatically approved. But I would probably recommend that you have your moderators approving drawings while you're streaming if you want to use it. So that, that's, a, that's like, on the streamer's end, is it, the, uh, the uh, approval process? Moderation tools, yeah. So the the streamer can moderate or um, the streamer's moderators. So like there's, the way it works is on Twitch, you can add an extension to your stream and set it as an overlay, which is kind of like a, I guess, a transparent website that appears over the stream. And so the moderators are like that aren't streaming can also access this and, and use it to approve or reject uh, drawings. <laughs> I, I really love um, the Twitch integration because I think it goes to the heart of what makes these games so special, which is that sense of community that develops around building strategies, um, swapping knowledge as well. And I think in a game like this, which is built around discovery of knowledge, um, it seems that like um, Twitch integration is, is a sign that you're acknowledging that kind of wider community that is going to be sharing tactics and tricks and, and things that they've discovered in the game. Was that... Uh, I guess a key element of creating this game, you were thinking about how people in a group might be playing it and sharing and talking to each other at all? I, for the law, yeah, I wanted to keep the game law, the narrative cryptic enough that we could get interesting theories. And I'm always intrigued to read what people think is going on in the game. Um, and same kind of with the items. Like I subscribe to the Dark Souls style of like law, just really vague obscure like dark kind of undertones not give the players like too much information but 
definitely have this strong foundational core of um, what it is conceptually and like all working towards that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I kind of, I suppose I, in, in the conception of the game, I didn't think that far ahead as to how people would play it. I would just wanted to make like a good game that I wanted to play for starters, which a lot of game developers do like, you just kind of want to set out and um, it's really nice, especially when you start solo to um, have the full sort of like freedom and creative control over something to really, really just like knuckle down and uh, I suppose prove yourself in a way. But at the same time, I definitely could not have done this without the team. It's amazing. Um, we've got like an amazing team of specialists. It's really good. It's made it so much more polished than it would have been if it was just me. <laughs> Uh, I want to I want to talk about you for a moment, Simon. So, um, how did you get your start in sure. game development? Yeah, I started in Perth. Uh, <laughs> I started working for Interzone Games, a company which uh, catastrophically imploded and owed the Australian tax office seven hundred thousand dollars by the time it was uh, wrapped up. And I was working as a concept artist there for a couple of years, and. Um, yeah, I was like going between sort of freelancing and working for for studios for about 10 years and also did some Steam Workshop assets. So got some art into Dota 2 and Counter-Strike Go. And um, yeah, it was have had a very varied uh, career that ended up going from concept artist to sort of, um, I guess, generalist or like technical artist and doing some UI uh, user experience sort of work as well. So very, uh, yes, very... <laughs> Very diverse. I'm going to ask a question that I feel like has changed and evolved a lot in the last six months, which is, what does your typical work day look like? Maybe both oh, yeah. pre-COVID and, and post-COVID where we find ourselves now. Yeah, pre-COVID, I would actually go to an office. We had an office, a distant memory, twice different had an office. But a couple of months into the Melbourne lockdown, we uh, ditched that office. Um, so... Yeah, I would say pre-COVID, I was probably working more sensible hours. I was still doing um, sort of five or six day weeks because I also work on a project with Jacob Janerka, who is from Perth as well, hey. called The Dungeon Experience. Yes, I work on a game called The Dungeon Experience uh, in a small capacity. So I'm mostly on Ring of Pain and then chuck an extra day or a day and a half onto that. Um, so I've always sort of been, yeah, generally doing like six day weeks. But yeah, now that COVID has hit, and especially with launch creeping up, it's been more like um, a very blurred work week that bleeds into like the next week. And yeah, there's a lot to do, especially running a company. It's um, it's very time consuming. So the last time we spoke to you was, I think, a couple of years ago when we, when you made when you made Bounce House. Mm -hmm. Bounce house. Yeah. How yeah. how was so? What was that? What was your development experience? How has that changed since then? To be because Ring of Pain is a very is a pretty pretty different game in tone. Yeah, and it's also gone much better than Bounce House, which is great, <laughs> which is reassuring. I liked uh, Bounce House a lot. Yeah, Bounce House was cool. Like I've got a <laughs> there's a special place for Bounce House. Um, but yeah, like we. Like every project is sort of like a stepping stone to the next. You learn a lot and you take that knowledge on and make something bigger and better. And um, after Bounce House, like because that was a really bright, colorful, like hyper casual mobile game, I was like, oh no, it's time to make something dark. It's time to make something really creepy and like bordering on horror. Jump straight into um, Ring of Pain. But um, yeah, the development process for that, because uh, that was pretty much just me and Matt Stenterford and other Perth friend um working on that so it was a very much a it's closer to like the dynamic i have with jacob on the dungeon experience it's just like direct collaboration kind of thing and then um, ring of pain starting as my own sort of like self-contained thing was um like you can do a lot more faster when you don't need to keep a whole team sort of in the loop and as a team expands it gets harder to um make sure that everyone has the same understanding and direction and goals and stuff and there's no like like the consistency gets harder you need to you need to manage the um um like deviation i guess in like 
especially when you don't really I don't really value documentation very highly so I haven't written down like a style guide or any of this it's all sort of like you know directed and like as you get a, as you work with people you get a sense of like they get a sense of how you you or the team or the project needs to be like brought into line to service itself um so i don't know if that answers your question i probably answered like five questions in there but i, I have a question about uh so the game is on the switch does it take advantage of the switch touch controls um yes so you can play it on switch with any of the control setups you can play it like with one joy con or like touch or um you know two is the standard I would say yes, it does. It, it it uses touch. the The issue with um the game and touch is that um we have a lot of hover states. So mm-hmm. like when you have a card selected, we really want to show you the outcome of what will happen if you tap on that or tap on an action. And so touch doesn't really have a hover state unless you actually tap and hold. So you can still play it play it that way and see all of the hover state like damage projections but generally recommend playing with controller do you have any tips uh for not like for dealing with burnout and not getting getting overwhelmed with your work i would say scope your project small uh that is probably how we best avoided burnout and even though i sort of like burn the candle at both ends quite a bit like just in terms of it's more of a self-imposed crunch i guess i try to take a day off but um yeah sometimes there's just a lot to do um to avoid burnout like i would say you know make sure you get at least a day off a week uh and you know go for that afternoon walk or yeah but most importantly just scope your thing small scope your project in a way that it's doable and this is sort of also a part of how the art style was derived i wanted to make an art style that was not highly highly detailed highly time consuming or rendered and also why it's a card game like when you when you execute a card game you don't need to make 3d models for everything you like we only have sort of like an idle animation for everything you don't need to over scope like you can get away with um smart choices i suppose with development and i guess like for to, to round off the episode and one final question um what, what what advice would you give for to give to some artists that really want to make the transition like you did because you were primarily artist but now now you now you run a company and how how would you how would you advise someone who's in that same position to get where you are Yeah so um for artists to run a company I would say I would say one of the most important things or the most valuable things, maybe not necessarily important. One of the most valuable things in my experience is just having a, a at least a basic, like rudimentary understanding of like different disciplines work. Um, learning coding and learning to program is surprisingly accessible. Like it's, oh, it's way more accessible than I thought it would be, especially when you use a game engine because um, there's so many resources online to learn and um you know coding tutorials and whatnot and if you have a bunch of programmer friends which you know obviously not everyone does i've been in the industry for 10 years so i was fortunate enough to have people i could um you know bug about how to do certain things and very very lucky that they were willing to answer and so yeah yeah the i would say just keep making keep making things and don't don't um don't pigeonhole yourself i guess um into like when i started as a concept artist i was kind of more purist i was like i'm never gonna learn 3d i'm never gonna do anything but illustrate things and paint things and yeah now i can do 3d and design and some programming and it's it's all really valuable like if you want to be making games as an indie game developer uh you're probably going to be a generalist uh but if you want to be um working for someone else or like collaborating closely with a small team um it's it's very good to be a specialist uh so there's all sorts of there's all sorts of directions you could head but um yeah to run a company i would say it's probably good to have a lot of knowledge about different facets of game development excellent i think that's a great answer 
And uh, well, that's all. That's about all we have time for tonight. If you want to find out more about Ring of Pain, you can head to ringofpain.com and you can also check out Simon's Twitter at AxSBoxel. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Nice. Um, I always get usernames. I always get really a lot of anxiety when I pronounce usernames. But um, yeah. thank you very much for being part of the show, Simon. Always great to have you on. Yeah. Thank you, both. Cheers, Adam and Mitch. Thanks for yeah. chatting to me. Pixel Sift is produced by so- Scott Quigg, Sarah Island, Fiona Bartholomeus, Mitch, myself, Mitch Lowe, Daniel Ang, Adam Christ- Christu, um, and Gianni Di Giovanni is our executive producer. Um, we wouldn't have been able to make 157 episodes of Pixel Sift if we didn't have the support of Murdoch University. So go check them out and tell them that we sent you. And if you're keen to learn more about a creative degree, head to murdoch.edu.au forward slash arts. Uh, that's murdoch.edu forward slash arts. Um, yeah, so um, as always, we'll be sticking in the links to everything we talked about on the show notes of our website. Yeah, and I don't know what you're doing on the internet, but if you're on the internet, you can come join us on Discord. We'd love to have you there. It's at pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord. You can share your creative work. Maybe you've drawn some art. Maybe you've drawn some fire bread uh, that you want to put in Ring of Pain. You can talk about anything that you want, really. Games, anything else. It's at pixelsift.com.au forward slash Discord. And if there's anything else uh, that you could do for us that we would really like, if you like this episode, if you like listening about games, if you want to hear about games development, then we want to ask you for a favor we need your help to share the show so tell a friend subscribe your brothers and sisters get people on their podcast app of their choice checking out pixel sift start someone's journey into the world of podcasts because once you've listened to a few episodes there's always a reason to listen to a few more Excellent. And uh, next week on the 29th of October, we'll be back in Pixel Sift Plays for the final part of our Moving Out playthrough. We're going to have some special, we might have a special guest on, who really knows. But tune in at this time next week on Thursday uh, to find out. But uh, for those of you watching at the moment, uh, thank you very much for for listening and watching. And uh, thank you very much, Adam and Simon, for joining me. And we'll catch you next time. Bye.